So Deb, with that, if you're um, if you're ready, um, I'd love to have you introduce our program. I am. Um, I even called Ciro today so I could properly pronounce his last name, and I hope I don't butcher it later. <clears throat> but <clears throat> um, this is really a little bit of serendipity. I was um, in search of a um, architecture photographer, and I happened to be in the Faulkner Gallery one day and there was an AIA exhibit going on. And as I walked around the room, um, many, many, many of the images were by Sido. So I took a photo with my iPhone and got his contact information and called him and told him who I was, what I was looking for, and um, that's how this program came to be. But as you can see from his uh, biography and his um, background, he has a very um, diverse and long professional career, um, which includes architecture photography, but so much more. And um, anyway, I'm really excited to present him to our club. And I think we pronounce his name Ciro Corriejo. Sit on, leaving it to you. Thank you very much, Deb. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm excited to share a little bit about my passion and my story with you. Um, I've had a very, very eclectic career in photography. And I think part of it is being Brazilian. That's, that's how we, we are, I guess. Um, and and this is, so I ask you to please um, bear with me. I'm just admitting someone that I know. Uh, but I think, it, Bill, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it up to you so I don't need to focus on that. Yeah, I'll go ahead and, and watch for, for new people coming in. Okay. Um, this is my first uh, photography presentation on Zoom. I lead groups, weekly groups. So I'm familiar with the platform, but photography is the first time. So I ask you to please bear with me. I'm going to use three different. I'm going to use Lightroom. I'm going to use uh, the web. And I'm going to use QuickTime to show a slideshow uh, since we, Bill advised me not to use video here. I have done some video as well. Um, so just a brief, and, and I'm going to alternate between speaking and showing. So we this is kind of fresher rather than um, the same thing for a long time and and i was thinking too that at some point maybe bill when i'm showing architect i'm going to tell a story show some previous work and then when i'm showing architectural photography that's a good time for people to even though my screen is going to be uh shared people can ask questions while i'm showing architectural work but i'll tell you Okay, and we can we can do that uh, with the raising hands or people just sending a message to to me or send it to everyone, and we'll we'll see them. Okay, and I, I will not. So I'll let you handle that. I'm not going to deal with answering, so I don't lose my my train of thought here. Perfect. Uh, so I did get a camera when I was seven, and that's when it all started. But I ne I had no idea that I I was ever going to be a professional until much later. I, I never had a camera, a real camera. I had a Kodak Instamat, Instamatic 33, which is not really a camera. Um, and it was when I went to Switzerland at 20 that I worked and had the, I could afford to buy my first Nikon camera. I spent a week, um, a year in Switzerland and then I came back um, at the time in Brazil. And I was uh, going to college to study um, advertising and marketing. I wanted to work in that industry and I loved photography, but it was only a hobby. And then one day, uh, uh, um, the, the, the best uh, advertising and fashion photography photographer came to the school where I was, was studying and gave a lecture that blew my mind and changed my life. And I'm very driven and I've had many stories and I'll tell you two or three of my drivenness here tonight. And I, um, this must have been a Thursday or a Friday, and on Monday I called his, his studio and I talked to his producer, to his studio manager, and I said, you know, I, I, I listened to 
uh, Duran's uh, lecture last week, and it changed my life. And it changed my life. I have to talk to him. And I was so convincing that I got an appointment with him the next day. And I came up to him, and this is the best photographer in the country. And I came up to him and I said, I have to work with you. I don't want to work with anyone else. I want to learn photography from you. Please give me a job. He said, I'm very flattered, but I don't have a position for you. But I know a place that does. So he sent me to a studio that at the time doesn't exist anymore, but this is 1988. Um, it, it's the studio of the largest publishing house in Brazil. And there were 15 photographers that worked there. And I got to assist for all of them. And that was my photography university, um, or at least the first por portion of it. Um, and then I thought, okay, advertising, beauty, um, fashion. Then I got a taste of it and I was really disappointed. And I really didn't feel like it was something for me. And I, I wanted to, so meaning, meaning, purpose and meaning has been always a uh, desire of mine. And you'll, get, you'll see where it ended up later in life. And so I uh, started working for the largest newspaper in Brazil. I ended up becoming, a, being a, um, a photo editor there. Um, I started developing interest for documentary photography, things that had more relevance that I perceived as having more relevance. Because even though photography is gorgeous, I've always had a, a, a beef with photography for myself because I thought it had to convey some meaning, it had to convey some value. Um, so I worked for the new, a newspaper for a few years, started getting interested in uh, volleyball. Brazil is big on indoor volleyball. And then uh, I ended up moving to, to the U.S. to be in a relationship. Uh, I ended up marrying her. She's a good friend now, and we were married for 14 years. So when I moved here, I had a profession, but I, had, I didn't have a career anymore. My career was over. And so I had to start over, and I started by writing, um, by doing human interest stories and writing my own stories. And this is when I'm going to start showing you a couple of things, and then I'm going to continue telling you a story. So I'm going to share my screen. Bear with me, please. And so um, I'm going to start with um, uh, this is prior to to moving to the U U.S. Just my first uh, documentary. And there's just a little bit of everything because there's so much really to show. But this is Cuba. Um, I, I really fell in love. This is 26, seven years ago in Cuba. And then I moved to the US and this is Burning Man. There's a little bit of uh, nudity if anyone has a problem with it, but just a little. So this is Burning Man in 1997 it was very different than what it is now and it was a phenomenal experience because it was really about freedom um, and it wasn't as organized as structured or as policed or uh, as it is nowadays i never wanted to go back because i never wanted to spoil the the, the first experience of being there and taking pictures and what I ended up doing, I, I was there for about a week. At the end, I felt that uh, we were not on equal footing. So I, d I decided to take my clothes off and I started taking photos of people naked while I was naked too. And it was about the most uncomfortable thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> I, I hated it, but I wanted to do it to, to honor the, those I was photographing. Um, couple more. And then I'm going to return to one more short story. So I'm getting, <clears throat> I'm working in the US. I am trying to make a living uh, at a new, completely new field, new country, new everything. And I'm getting more and more interested in, in real stories and, and relevance and so forth. And my big hero was Sebastian Salgado, the, the Brazilian photographer who used to belong to Magnum 
now he has his own agency, uh, did workers, migrations, uh, one of the most, most phenomenal uh, documentary photographers ever that ever existed. And one day I went to San Diego to see a show of his. I, know, I knew he was gonna speak there. I had, I, I had met him in person briefly before and at the end of the show, at the, uh, his lecture, I came up to him and I said, hey, so I spoke Portuguese to him. And I said, Joe, um, I would love to work with you. He didn't even notice. He didn't even hear me. Hear me. It was like, I wasn't even there. And then I paused for a moment and I said, because the guy had a major, major importance in my life. So I, I stopped for a second and I said to him, Sebastian, I actually want you to teach me how to be a man. When I said that, he stopped on his tracks and now he's paying attention to me. And now we start talking. So now I exist in front of the guy and we start having a conversation and having a conversation and we exchange phone numbers. This is way before cell phones. Um, um, and we start talking and he's shooting, he was shooting here in central California at the time at the plantations and he was doing the, the migrations. Uh, and I said, I want to work with you. I want to work with you. I'm, I'm an amazing assistant. I'm going to change your life. Uh, let me work with you. And he said, Oh, you know, I don't really use assistance. I just do my thing and I relate to my subjects nakedly. I said, okay, but I would love to work with you. And we kept talking and talking. And then he said, let me talk to my wife, who is the director of our agency in Paris, and I'll get back to you. This was probably September 1996. In December, I'm in Brazil in my mother's house, and he calls me and he says, Ciro, we're ready for you. Come work for us in Paris. So I did. I, I worked for the agency for a couple of months. It was a completely different story because I ended up working with the wife, doing something completely different than what I wanted to, to do, which is work with him. I wanted to learn how to be a man. I already knew how to be a woman, given my uh, a feminine upbringing. My, my, I, I was brought up by women, so I had that part of the training. I wanted to learn the masculine part of the training and uh, didn't, didn't happen. Anyway, so I came back, 1998, and I was disillusioned with photography and I said, no, let's break up. I'm breaking up with photography and I'm going to do the other thing that I love, which is psychology, spirituality, understanding human nature. Who are we really? So I went to San Francisco. I studied for two years. And then one day a friend, a new friend looks at my work. I hadn't been shooting for two years. This is 2000, 2000. And she says to me, you don't, she looks at my work and she starts crying. And she says, you don't have the right not to be taking photographs. And that hit me. And I said, oh, my God, I need to look into this. So long story short, I, I decided to stop the doctorate uh, in psychology that I was doing. It was not quite the format. Being a therapist was not quite what I, what I was looking for, the format of what I was looking for. And so I stopped. Um, Came back to, went back to Santa Barbara, where I had been living, and uh, resumed photography. And now I, was, um, now I was developing a very different relationship with photography. Still, professional photography wasn't happening. It was more like a hobby. It's hard to say hobby because driven uh, as a professional, uh, it's hard to say hobby. But it was a hobby because it, it didn't have the intent of making a living with. It was just nourishing my passion. And so I started going toward what had inspired me my whole life, which was the ur urban environment. I come from Sao Paulo, 20 million people in the largest cities in the world. So that, that was my upbringing. I started shooting in San Francisco, New York, Sao Paulo, uh, in Italy. And, and, and I started gathering. And this is when I'm going to, again, share the screen and, and show you something else. But before I actually show the urban, I forgot to show you uh, the work that I did for myself, a personal project that I did around the time, right after I, I came back from Paris and had been working with Salgado, which is more of a documentary project in Brazil. I'll show you a couple of photos of that. Um, 
and I called it the, the stone breakers of Ilha Bela. Ilha Bela is an island off the coast of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And I, I love books. So this is, I, I laid out a book and I printed it and I bound it myself. I'll show it to you when I, when I finish this. Um, it, it's such a palpable, powerful way to, to handle photography and it's like real stuff. So this is the story of, of, a, of a, a profession that is um, a very long profession for humans and it's brutal because you're breaking stones day in, day out. And so I pursued this as my personal project and I wanted to make a book and so forth. It, it didn't really go anywhere. It was more of a, of a practice for me in, in portrait and documentary. It was kind of putting a little bit to test of what I had uh, drank from my time uh, drooling over Salgado's work. Um, so so this, is, this is the phase um, when I'm here back in, in Santa Barbara and I'm roaming the cities and I'm uh, uh, gobbling up any image, Los Angeles, everywhere, everywhere I go, I can only see images, 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 and it's all, it's all, um, um, uh, um, architectural um, graphic stuff and you see there's a this what you see are, are pages of this book that I laid out that's always my with the exception of some fine art prints but that's how I I, I related to my work is, is via uh, printing and, and binding and so this is Sao Paulo New York, Harlem, actually, Sao Paulo, Oscar Niemeyer, for those who know. This is the MoMA in uh, San Francisco, Torino in Italy, New York City. This is all early, um, early work. It's, it's really when I committed to photography. So my work started becoming deeper, more interest, more interesting, more layered. And so I started creating a portfolio in basically the urban environment. And then one day, a friend of mine says, who, who was a client who purchased a bunch of my fine art work and my portraits. And then he says to me, oh, you have to meet an architect. Um, friend of mine. Oops, no, I don't want this to continue. Hold on. Um, you have to meet this architect, friend of mine. Um, you're going to hate it off because your work is so beautiful. He's such a great architect. And so, just to show you very quickly, um, this, let's see. So, this is the book that I showed you, Stone Breakers, and printed and bound, hand, hand, handmade everything was handmade so it's not it's just, just there's just one one print one sample of the book but it feels so good to hold it like this so this is the stone stone breakers of Ilia Bella and then this is the little urban scapes that I just showed you same idea And then this one I have yet to show you coming work that is coming up. This is a very rough, uh, low, low res, low quality. I was doing a project called travel books and I was going to do different cities and I was going to do a book and then the recession hit. I, I had a sponsor already, but then it, it went to, to the trash can, but it, it, and then it ended up morphing into something else. Anyways, I'm doing a really poor job showing this. So uh, back to, to the friend who wanted me to meet a friend of his who was archi an architect. Now I'm going to share the screen again. So we do meet, we do hit it off, and he gives me a project to test my skills. And so it was a guest house, this little guest house you're looking at. And I, being the driven 
person that I am. I spent a whole week and I shot with a Leica. At the time, I, I was still shooting film. This is 2002. So I shot, this is a Leica, uh, an M6. I shot with an M6. I, saw, I shot with a Hasselblad and I shot with a Sinar. And I shot a lot for a whole week. And then I did a little book, uh, the one I, did I show you? I don't think, I don't know if I show, I, probably I didn't show you. Um, and, and so I made it into a little book and I showed it to him and he was so excited. Shubin and Donaldson architects, uh, Robin Donaldson. And my first architectural project became my, my career. Um, I started getting jobs from him. It, it was a word of mouth. I started getting jobs from everyone in town and I never really advertised or sought anyone for, and work just kept coming. And it was a, it was a very organic and natural um, process, completely effortless. So this was really the beginning of my architectural career. And this is the, the end of a little book. And then I continued doing my urban uh, work. This is the Cinar shooting Polaroid 55. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but you get to keep the, the negative and then you can have, so this is the, the very high res quality. I'm gonna pause it for a second. This is shot with a type 55 Polaroid. And I, I, so I kept the positive, I fixed it. And then the negative, I carried a bucket uh, up and down San Francisco while shooting uh, type 55. So this is 2005. These are uh, drum scanned uh, uh, files from, from the Polaroid 4x5. And then what I started doing is, um, this is the same client. I, the same client that gave me the first work. This is actually the beginning of the career. I, I would go to, to the place and take photos and then I would show him and, I, and show him how I could do it. And I got the job. So this is kind of my own, I never did scouting, but this project I did scouting and then I show the photos and the, and, the, and the architect was so excited that he hired me to shoot it, to do the actual. And this was published in the Los Angeles Times Magazine at the time. This is one of my favorite photos of all time that I've ever taken. And now, um, uh, Bill. Um, yes, I'm here. So maybe now I'm gonna show architectural photos. And um, perhaps you can take questions of anyone whom I want to ask. I just request that they be related to architectural photography for the time being, and anything else we'll talk at the end, just so we, we stay on topic. Uh, with, okay, so with, there's, with, there's two things that we can do for our participants in the meeting. Um, if you have a question, um, you can use the raise hand function, then we come back and ask. Um, if you're um, comfortable with using the chat function, you can send either me or everyone the question so that they see that. And then when we get back to, uh, to Ciro, we can, uh, uh, I'll, I can read the questions. I don't think I can read the chat if I have my... No, I, I can do that for us. I'm okay, just saying that uh, uh, either put their hand up and we'll ask them when it comes time to do that or uh, send it to me and then I can read the questions to okay. you. Okay, and I'll... I'll answer questions while I talk a little bit about each project that I'm showing. So um, this is um, Bahia Beach in Puerto Rico by uh, SB Architects. They're a, a very an international firm based in um, in San Francisco. And this was an amazing timing because they sent me there and a month later, uh, Hurricane Maria hit the island and destroyed a good portion of this house. And oh, this one, let me go back. This one is in Kuwait in the Middle East. Um, this is a 45,000 square foot home. And it doesn't look that big at all. It was the, the proportions are quite 
amazing and it has five floors and it was quite an experience to go there uh, the house was so big that I I thought I was going to have time to shoot to shoot and then to travel a little bit in the Middle East but it wasn't it was impossible because I had to extend my days shooting the house uh, the, the client had asked me to do originally um, um, 25 or so images and I ended up doing like, I mean, I shot 300 and he ended up choosing 50 or so. So this is another house. This is a house. This is a house on, for you Santa Barbarans. This is on Ashley and this it was destroyed by the mudslides. This house doesn't exist anymore. And it's interesting, intuition. The owners called me one day before and said, you know, my house is looking pristine right now. I want to shoot it while it's pristine. It's a very interesting, uh, I've never heard such a thing before quite that way. This is Shubin and Donaldson, Santa Barbara, um, Toro Canyon. And John Mike Cohen, the owner and the designer, he actually did the design and then Shubin and Donaldson um, executed it. So I have a, a couple of questions as we're going. Um, Go for it. Curiosity about the camera that you were using for these, and also if you know the architects, if you could share that. Oh, the architects I just did. Architects of which? Oh, the, the actual people or the firm? The uh, question is, is just uh, to mention the architects. I guess you've done that as I, you I've, I've been doing it, yeah. This is, so this is John Mike Cohen. <coughs> who designed the house. It was executed by Shubin and Donaldson. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, um, uh, so the camera. Uh, I, I shoot, it took me a while. I'm gonna pause this for a second. It took me a while to switch to digital. I switched in uh, 2006. And I've had all the Mark, the five Ds. Um, and then, so this is from five, from, from uh, from Mark II to Mark to Mark IV, which I, what I have right now, uh, except for the the little first project that I showed you that had film, everything else since that um, has been digital and uh, uh, the 5D Canon 5D. So this is uh, Newman Mendro Andrulides, who is, who's also they are also my sponsors for my journey that I'll speak about at the end if we have time. I think we will have time. Th these projects are in Santa Barbara. This is Malibu. This is rare. I, I don't really do uh, real estate, but this is a company, a high-end company in Malibu, and they hire me to do their, their, their estates when they're ready to sell. They build and then they sell, and they hire me to shoot. called Marisol Malibu. And uh, the architects, this architect, I don't know. Um, Barry Burkus did something for them that I shot, but I, I'm not showing here. Sorry, I, I never knew who the architect for this one is because my contact was, was with the developer. So this is Allen Construction, and, um, and the architect is Peter uh, Becker, who died. He was alive when I shot the house. Um, this is uh, Hope Ranch, uh, a remodel. I love this project. Seldom do you see a remodel that is so juicy to shoot. And this is mostly, I'm gonna go back a little bit. I, I, sh I use natural light for everything. I never illuminate stuff. In this particular house, I, I illuminated, this is, I lit this a little bit and this, but that's about it. Everything else is natural light that I, that I composite so that it looks very, very natural. I can't stand the look of HDR. So this is, uh, again, um, SB Architects in San Francisco. This is Las Vegas. Um, a house that they built for a developer in Las Vegas. I really like this project. I really like the photos. This is a, um, um, oh God, I forgot his name, Neff. 
um, in Santa Barbara. This is Newman Mendrandrolitis as well. A gorgeous project that they did on the foot carpentry of foothills. Be happy to answer any questions while we, you, we see architecture. It's very difficult to convey in, inside, indoor, outdoor in a natural way. Either you overlight it, this is also pneumonitis. This is a uh, Warner Group in uh, Santa Barbara. This is, um, this is the, the I, I didn't mention this. And I apologize, Warner Group sent me to Kuwait to shoot that project. That's the one I didn't mention. It's the same company here. And this is um, um, Newman Mandrolitis. And uh, that is that for this one. And any questions so far? Um, one, one that's just come in. Did you miss having people to shoot as a part of the architectural scene? Oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, not at all. Not at all. I think I went through phases in life and I love people and I love interaction and I love silence and emptiness. I'm, I'm a very minimalistic photographer. I go in and I, and I take, take out most everything there. Uh, sometimes we bring in everything. Sometimes I've shot houses that we had to bring in artwork, furniture. Um, what else? Pretty much, yeah, everything. Or we've exchanged it because it was so um, unflattering to the design. Um, but I, I like emptiness. Um, we have um, one of our members, Zoltan, you have your hand up. Do you want to unmute and ask your question? Oh, well, my question was uh, along the same lines. Uh, I, was gonna one, I was wondering if these homes are actually inhabited or are they just stage set? For, for the photography shoot? Most of them are inhabited, the vast majority. I'd say from everything I showed you, probably if I showed you, I don't know, 15 projects, maybe two or three, two or three were, were kind of staged or were, one was a rental, uh, but everything else is either their, their main home or a second home. A lot of the times it's a second home, but it's fully, uh, um, um, furnished uh, so there were um some other questions that have come in they're all kind of related so one was how you handle mixed lighting and the other uh the next one is how do you color correct mixed lighting and how do you decide how much uh for example how much do you make it com completely white or not the third one is related in just how much post-processing you do and if so what do you use do you use lightroom or what do you use for your uh, <clears throat> okay so the workflow um, I'm assuming color correction with, when, with mixed lighting, meaning when I lit, when I light it with artificial lighting. Um, um, I know that there are very specific and scientific ways to calibrate and to color correct and gels and filters. And I try that. And, and what I realized is I have, I have to be very spontaneous in the, in the way that I move through the work. Otherwise it, it's just, horrendous for me. So the way I figured it out is this. I get the best color um, uh, reading that I can in the scene. And then I just shoot stuff like that with whatever uh, uh, differences and sources there are. And then I just deal with it in, in post-production. And yes, heavy post-production, super heavy post-production for two reasons. One, I do my own HDR, so it's compositing, handmade compositing, which is just impossible. I don't recommend it to anyone. And, and then I go by the, the pleasure, um, and I'm probably a lot more interesting if I show this while I'm, so if I show stuff while I'm speaking. So, uh, so here, this is, this is a, a cleaner, white sometimes it's better to go warmer sometimes it's better to go cooler and uh, so or cool off these uh fixtures um so they're not too yellow so i, I do it separately but you want but i want to i wanted to keep the the warmth of the reflection of the fireplace that is 
over there. And so I do it, I mean, there's an overall correction and then I do very localized corrections. Um, and then I get to what I, I, I don't think that there's a right or wrong. It's just, it's, it's, it's either, either uh, pleasant or unpleasant. So see here, this is warmer, end of the day. There's some fire. This is cooler, uh, uh, early afternoon. And so um, it's really, this is very cool because it's almost nine time, nighttime. This is very cool. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but it's, it's really, what I like is to not have contamination in the sense that something, something is one thing. It, it is one thing. It's not uh, blue and yellow. Like, like for example, here, uh, it could be too yellow. I don't know how I did this. How did it become so big? Oh, there you go. Um, so this is pretty neutral. It's, it's a, it is a, um, uh, an overcast day, which is pretty cool to shoot interiors. I don't think we, we're missing the ocean there. It's okay. See, this is neutral. There's some warmth, warmth in, the, in the sunset, but it's, it's neutral. It's fairly neutral, but not too cool. This is, this is uh, pretty warm, even for me. Uh, but otherwise, it would be too sterile if I made it any cooler than this. This, I think, benefits from the, from the design to be a little warmer. Another, another question has come in uh, asking about tripod versus hand-holding your, your photos. Oh, zero hand-holding. Architectural, zero hand-holding. There's no such a thing. I do 20 exposures. I, I, there, there's no hand-holding whatsoever. Everything else you saw that has people and travel, that's all. That's all, um, but imagine this. Imagine how many layers I have here to get. Sorry, I'm taking a little beating from the, from the web platform here. Uh, I mean, there's so many layers here to, to, add, to, to add in the different exposures here. There's no way to do this handheld. No, you have to put it on a tripod. I don't even touch the camera. I, I, I control the camera with an iPad with a, um, what is it called? Forgot, forgot the, the thing, the router that connects to the camera. And then it, um, it triggers the camera and I, and I do the bracketing without touching because believe it or not, if you, um, if you bracket the camera by switching, by changing um, shutter speed on the camera, it shakes. And even if it shakes one or two pixels, it's like hell to, to um, it's out of register. So you, you really don't want to touch the camera and you want a heavy tripod and, and that's, that's about it. Um, and I'll be happy to answer more questions while I prepare to show you another, something else. Um, a question about lenses that you use. Do you ever use tilt shift lenses? Or yes, not? yes, I do. I, I, my favorite lenses, my favorite is the 17 uh, tilt shift Canon. Um, and in the 24, the new, the new version of the 24, the, the old version, it was so bad optically. It was horrendous. The new one is good. And I haven't bought yet the, the new lenses, the 50, the, I forgot what the other one is. And then I think there's a 50, a 90, and a 135 tilt shift. Yeah. I think I only need the 50. I don't need the other two. They're too long. And sometimes I use, I use the zoom like a 24 to 70, or sometimes I even use a 70 to 200, all Canon, without tilt shift. And then I just, I either shoot level or I, I, I correct perspective in, in post. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll show you a few more different faces of mine with this desire for photography, for, for uh, the urban design, architecture, and the fascination with, um, with, with the urban environment, I, I started, I took that little urban scapes to a different level and I turned it into what I called the travel books. And I did one on Sao Paulo, 
on the city of Sao Paulo, and I did one on, on Paris. And I, I'm going to show you two clips. And even though they're, they're quick time, uh, I think you'll, you'll be fine because they're stills. And for, if for some reason it's, it's, it's looking horrible, just tell me and I'll just scratch it. So just um, a, a reminder when you do your next screen share, if it's going to be with sound from the, from the, the video or the web, to click that little box on your share screen. Awesome. Thank you for, for reminding me. Yes. Okay. So let's switch to this. And I'm going to start, and then you tell me if if uh, if the sound is good, and if the transition, and if it, if the quality image is good. This is high high definition here for me. Let's see if it. The sound is fine. How's the quality of the image? Excellent. Okay. okay. Wonderful. Let's just continue.
So this is Paris. Then I'm going to show you a clip from Sao Paulo, travel books. And I had sponsors and I was showing this at the Presidio in Santa Barbara in a huge inflatable screen. It was really fun. This is 2011, 2012. Um, so this is Sao Paulo.
how did the video go? Good. Good. Very well. Very well. Uh, the, the video pieces, the, the transitions throughout were, were um, a little jerky. The video worked from my end, for, all right. Okay, cool. Zoltan, do you have another question? You, oh, you're, you're, you're mute. You're still muted. Uh, yeah, basically, uh, um, uh, until the end of the Brazil uh, uh, Sao Paulo uh, images, uh, uh, I, I noticed there was a big difference in the, the way you uh, uh, photograph people in Paris, where you always seem to catch somebody looking directly into the camera. And in, in Sao Paulo, it was kind of the opposite. Uh, you were kind of at a distance there, but near the end there, you did a lot of, uh, quite a few uh, images of people that were looking right into the camera. And I was wondering, how, how far apart were these um, um, completed? P Paris, I shot in 2007, 2008. In Sao Paulo, I shot um, across many years. Um, some overlap with Paris. Uh, I think Sao Paulo is such an intense and at times violent city that there is kind of a distance. There's more of a reservation. And the people that I shot up close are actually in a situation that is almost like a park where there's more interaction. With the exception of the last, the video part, which was a, uh, what it's, it's the equivalent to a farmer's market. It's like a fair. They happen in every neighborhood in, in Sao Paulo, in Brazil. And people are super friendly and everybody's smiling. And so everyone is yeah, looking in the, into the camera. And that's the clip. It's, it's the friendliness, the relatedness of Brazilians and, and, and so forth. A Co couple of comments and questions come in. Um, yes. One that says, I see one more career for you on location fashion photography based on the lady with the Zara bag. Uh, um, that's, the, a, that's the only one I probably will never pursue. <laughs> <laughs> um, a comment about the, um, your soundtrack about San pa Sao Paulo. Wow, um, I was enjoying that too. I'm curious about what, what your soundtracks were. And then um, a comment, just that your, your people had so much movement you didn't notice when the video started. So all good stuff. Oh, that's wonderful. I love that. I love that comment. Thank you for that. If you send me an email, um, and you, you can find my information on inwardride.com. Inward, inward ride, as in motorcycle, inward ride. I'll talk about it later. And I'll, send, I'll be happy to send you the, the names of the, the two uh, songs, or, or three, I think, total Paris, Sao Paulo. Um, thank you for, for, for your comments uh, and for all your questions. I want to show you, um, uh, th and then the transition in the next 10 years, so we're in 2002, was from the urban to the natural. And then I became, which is something that I never honestly was very interested in. I was a nut for the, for the built environment, and then I became a nut for the unbuilt environment. Maybe that's what getting older is. Um, so uh, I'm going to show a quick transition um, into my subject matter, what I started shooting. And now this is the hobby. And so, so careers and hobbies in, in the hobby, the two. So the two tracks, career and hobby, very strong, very personal, happening simultaneously. I'm always carrying a camera. Right now I'm not. And then I have breaks when I don't take one photo, which is happening right now. And then I go back full on but I've always had the track and everything you saw was uh, that was not initially professional, but I ended up create either creating a career or informing my, my professional, um, my, my career. Um, and now um, I'm going to show you a, a little bit of natural and then um, inward ride. And then that's it. So let me share the screen one more, one more time. So these are a couple of images um, in our neighborhood. You might recognize this. Um, off Camino Cielo, this is Ojai. Citrus, this is Ojai too. Just a few. Ojai. Um, 
Padaro, the Padaro Hill, the Summerland Beach, this is Sao Paulo. Butterfly, Summerland, Miami Beach, um, Big Sur, Camino Cielo, and this is uh, Jackson Hole. This is my first long motorcycle trip to, this is Arches in Utah, Arches in Utah. And then now I'm going to tell you a little story and then I'll show you what inward ride is. So any questions so far? There was one. Um, oh, I, I'm reading the hobby. My phone. Um, hey, Eric. Good to see you here. Um, well, um, now I carry a Fuji. Uh, my my everyday camera is a Fuji um, XT. No, X Pro. 2, what's the name again? X Pro Two. X Pro Two. And I have one zoom because it's hell to switch lenses when you're traveling because of the dust. So I don't want to switch lenses anymore. I have one zoom. Zoom which is the, it's, a, it's equivalent to a 24 to 85, something like that, 16 to 55, I think it is. And it's a phenomenal optical quality. And then I carry that, and then I carry a, um, uh, so, so I would say that's the hobby, even though I use it professionally as well. Um, and I, the Canon, I have 17, 24 tilt shift. I had a zoom, uh, 24 to 70, but it broke. I haven't needed it. And I have a 70 to 200. And these are the 70 to 200 on the Canon Mark, uh, 5D Mark, Mark IV. And the X-Pro2 with the zoom are my, uh, it's what I took on my three months sabbatical. And, and I don't, you know, the, the thing about iPhone for me is, see, I'm an old timer, I'm 55. I learned how to take a, a picture hiding the world entirely so i have to see everything in here the iphone i don't separate the world from from what i'm shooting and that's a problem for me even though when i shot four by five on a scenar i could frame it and upside down but then actually not true because there was the the cloth that isolated the world so i have a problem just because i've been doing this for 40 years um through a little hole uh, i shoot a lot with the iphone and some photos are good but not my best work for sure. Um, and uh, landscape, it's really, I, it's not, I don't think there's a lens for this or for that. I think it, what's important is to test lenses for optical quality. And, and there's a major difference between lenses and some of them are just phenomenal. And I'll leave it at that. Um, let me, let me tell you, actually, let me tell you a quick story here. So, uh, two tracks on my, uh, in, in my life, photography, beauty, uh, natural beauty, beauty in, in outer life. And then internally, I've had depression for th uh, 36 years. So I've had to work really hard to stay afloat. My mind was the biggest challenge of my life, not the external uh, circumstances. And the way that I found to do that is to develop a practice to study psychology, to study spirituality to dedicate myself to understanding, okay, if what my mind tells me is not real, what, what is real then, right? So, so the tr two tracks of photography, the career, and then the, the career that I've um, explored in different forms, psychology, um, uh, when I was doing the doctorate, and then I continue studying my own program and doing trainings and retreats and teachers and so forth. And, um, and a year ago in March, I had the biggest breakdown of my life. Um, I, 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 I reached uh, rock bottom. I was in Brazil and I realized that I couldn't continue the way I was. And basically, um, I, I had to make a choice. Either I had no life left the way I, I had been living or I had to really go full on to, 
okay, who am I? I need to be, and, and who am I is not an abstract question. It's like, if I'm not everything that I've been pretending that I am, the shell of success and what I'm, being a man is and what I need to accomplish and so forth, if that doesn't work for me, what does? And so I started asking questions. And one of the things I did is I asked my quest, uh, the following question. I said, okay, if I, were, if I had been diagnosed with a, with a terminal illness, um, or if I had won the lottery, what would I do? And the answer was the same. I would go on a motorcycle journey immediately. So I said, why am I going to wait for either? No way I'm going to wait for either. My life is over as it is anyways. Let's try something different. So I created a project called Inward Ride. First, it was going to be a, a, a journey of my own. And then I'm, my marketing skills kicked in. I said, I'm going to make this into a project. And I want to make a contribution to people. So I started a blog. I started writing about my experience with depression, not as a pity party, but as, okay, so what is this from the inside out? And what, what uh, avenues and solutions do I have, have I found for this? So I created this project. I, I got sponsorship. I got a lot of people donated to help me with this. I went to do a ketamine treatment for, for uh, treatment resistant depression in, um, in Portland. So I, I pointed my compass in that direction. And I went, I did the treatment, I did a bunch of other things. Um, and it was, it was one of the most important things I've done in my life. One of the most remarkable things, because basically I chose myself in a way that was so, uh, such um, loyalty and integrity. And then I, I've been practicing living a life that caters to who I am. Um, and what, what is that on a daily basis? And so what happened was uh, a year later, um, I decide finally, and, I, and, and simultaneously I've been asking, okay, so I need to share what I know. I know a lot, and, and, but what is the format? And so I, I realized that, uh, so I decided to create a, practicing, a practice in which I, I mentor and support and guide people. Um, it's kind of a, a transformation leader, or one way of putting it. Um, and, but in a very grounded way with tools that really uh, are practical from psychology and spirituality tools that really make a difference for, for a person suffering. Because in any situation in life, the one thing that is the same is the relationship that we have to ourselves. And that's what I teach, is how to create compassion and powerful ways to relate to yourself in any situation of, of suffering. And then COVID strikes, and I said, that's it. In three weeks, I created what I call the Connection Series. I've had um, three group, groups already. Uh, two of them are in the, uh, sec the second phase, Connection Series 2. I have a new group starting um, in July. It's open. If any anyone is interested, you can find out on in inward ride, inwardride.com. And you feel free to, to contact me with any questions. I'll be happy to talk in person. And, and I went on this phenomenal trip. And... I'm going to show you a couple of photos um, of this trip. And then I'll be happy, if, if we have time, I'll be happy to answer any, any more questions. Um, so this is a very short, short version of, this is the, the pre-trip uh, setup, attempting to take things and things got a lot, this was too heavy, too big. Then it got, got smaller. This is the final setup. Um, this is me riding, uh, first, first night camping in Morro Bay. Uh, I had camped six time in, times in my life when I started this trip. So I was really, really scared and I was very prepared, but I had no experience. This is in Oregon, so I'm making my way to Portland to do the treatment this is mount hood and i was about 35 pounds heavier than i am now uh Tilikum bridge in portland nice sir thank you this is me when i'm shooting others riding motorcycle the two camera setups um the 
uh, oh God, Columbia River Gorge, Highway 30, historic Highway 30 on the gorge. I just, it was breathtaking. This is Joaquina Falls, also in Portland. Corbett, technically. This is Gresham in, the, in that area where I stayed. This is High Rock. I crashed a wedding party, or they, they crashed my, my photo up. <laughs> this is me. Oh, so what happened was I was, my plan was to go to Canada, but it got cold too quickly. So I turned around and I went south. I went to the desert and I, I was resisting going to the desert so much. I wanted to go north to, to, to mountains and, and, and then I ended up going to Utah. So here I am in uh, Oregon making my way to Idaho. This is a camping site and a, a guy uh, that was camping put his dog on my bike. I didn't see it. I saw the photo later. <laughs> making my way to um, Utah. The beast, my steed. This is Utah, uh, Colorado River. Um, this is Canyon Lens, one of the most phenomenal things I've ever seen in my whole life. It's worth pausing for a second. I, it was breathtaking. There's no thing, I, I wrote a blog about this, a blog post. There's nothing I can say that will do justice to this experience for those who haven't been there. This is Schaefer Trail, also in the Canyon Lens. It's a paradise for off-road. Same here. I couldn't do this part because my rear brake stopped working. And that's when you need uh, rear brakes, is when you're going down in a, on a dirt road. Otherwise, you can do the front. Colorado River. This is Valley of the Gods, making my way back. Um, what is this called? I forget. Um, uh, Monument Valley, going to, to, this is Zion. And again, I'm just showing a couple of photos of each thing. This is my first spill in three months and it was completely silly. So this is a 600 pound motorcycle with another 200 pounds. And I lifted the, this whole thing alone without an unloading. I said, there's no way I'm gonna unload this. And I did it. Mojave, going to Joshua Tree. And this is Ojai, I ended, up, I ended my trip in Ojai. I spent three nights here before I moved back to my house. And then a couple, so that's where I camped in the Denison, Denison um, Park. This is when the, this is after I returned with a friend, dear friend Dion, and there's snow in the back in the mountains. It was a gorgeous and the light, it looks like I have a major um, artificial light. It's the sun. It's so beautiful. It looks like studio lighting outdoors. Um, topa Topa with a little snow and then up on 33 with a lot of snow. And this is back, back in Ohio. So that is it, my friends. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Comments, complaints, rants. Um. What the one question that's in the chat currently is what lens do you prefer for landscape photography? That's in the camera. Uh, whichever is really good optically. Um, because of what I do, for me, landscape not nowadays. I, I mean, I have a 90. 90 millimeter F Fuji, that is the equivalent to a 135 and 35 millimeters. That is the sharpest lens I've ever used. And sometimes I do landscapes with that. Um, I, the 70 to 200, the way it separates the background, um, um, it's, it's beautiful. 
I, I mean, this is, this is so personal. I, I have a tendency not to go for the super wide angle uh, thing. I like to, to limit it a little more. Um, I see the question now. Um, well, what do you mean by how I came to this style? I don't understand the question. Ken. If others aren't oh, my, uh, seeing oh, the hi. chat. Can the, you hear me? Uh, yes, oh, yeah. you can hear me. I can see. Okay, you know, but I, I was just watching your style and I, I've, I'm just curious uh, how you came to uh, find this appealing because uh, your images appear like more contrasty and more saturated. And a lot of people like that. Uh, I'm just wondering, is this natural or did you emulate someone or did you uh, change your styles as you grew as the photographer? Do I, do I hear you're saying that you don't like that? You prefer some, some more muted? No, 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 not at Which all. Which would be completely not, fine. Which would be completely Not fine. at all. Not at all. Um, I like your style. I'm just wondering why you do it that way. Well, I am an intense person in case you haven't noticed. Um, I started out, my architectural work was so intense that some people called it hyper realism. It was so intense, saturated and dark and co contrasted and so forth. And then I've been softening my, actually, I, I've been going the other way around. I, I went from highly intense to a lot more um, dynamic range in terms of color and, and, and saturation and even uh, highlights and shadows. So I, because I, I, I am so intense, in, in other words, I don't do half anything. I do full everything. I am fully in and on everything I take on and do. And photography is no, photography is no different. And so I think it's just an expression of my personality. And, but trust me, it's been softened. <laughs> it's a lot less. Um, thank you a lot less. Uh, thank you, Judith, for your comment, for my candidness. Yes, I. Um, part of the healing is 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 addressing shame. So we're all human. We all have challenges, um, and it's very, it's it's very it's it's actually very rewarding to be, to not have to protect or to hide or to or to have a pose or to have to create. Uh, oh, I'm the photographer which is nowadays is not even a thing anymore. Everyone is a photographer. When I started, it was a thing. It's like, you're a celebrity, you're a movie director. Nowadays, you're nothing. You're, everyone is a photographer. And I'm happy with it because I, I'm not even a photographer. I'm just myself, you know? I'm, I'm myself on a daily basis trying to figure, figure out what that is. And then I happen to take photos. And I happen to teach people to, to be real with themselves as well. Um, thank you, Eric. Yeah. You're part of it too. We did a Hoffman Quadrinity process. A friend was writing here. That was one of the most transformative experiences in my life, 2000, 2015, in the, in the healing process. But it's an ongoing. There's no getting anywhere. It's always unfolding. Any, any, anyone wants to speak and um, say something? Or I, I love participation. I. I um, want to say thank you to, to you for being here and, and the advance work that you did. And thanks to uh, Deb Gibson for connecting and, and uh, getting you to join, uh, join with us and share this information. We've had great turnout. Our high, po high point uh, was 46 participants tonight. That's a, that's a, um, a real high point for us. And uh, I you really appreciate the sharing that you did tonight. So. Uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for having me over. It's the first time I've done this on Zoom, and it actually, not too bad. <laughs> thank you, Seto. I mean, thank you. It's, it as I said, it was very serendipity that I found you, and um, I think what you've shared with everybody is just phenomenal. And oh, thank you. I really um, appreciate it. Thank you. And whoever wants to reach out, if I can help you in any way, if you have questions. I'm here, inwardride.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be well, everyone. Well, that was so cool.
Yeah, that was interesting. You missed the part about the concussion. So what's next? Do we just eject? <laughs> <laughs> yep, we have uh, we've recorded tonight, and uh, probably within about a week, we should uh, get that up as a, a private YouTube link. And uh, I see that you've been recording as well. Yes. And uh, yeah, look uh, look forward. Well, we want to say thank you, and hope that you'll continue to engage with the club from time to time. It's just I, uh, great I, to have. I'd love to. Let's see what's next uh, in terms of another varietal of my photography. But it's not going to be Zara advertising on the streets. <laughs> I, that I can guarantee. 